most important painter to represent Bruges in the Renaissance was Gerard David, but like Memling, he was not born there. David was born in Holland, but Holland was not yet the place where even butchers and bakers had masterpieces on their walls, so he left for what was then a more artist-friendly place. There's a presumed self-portrait by him in his picture called The Virgin Among Virgins. He's unobtrusively present in the back corner, the only man in the picture. All the women are virgin martyrs, identifiable by their attributes. St. Catherine's crown, for example, is decorated with the wheel on which she was tortured. I've mentioned the popularity of justice pictures before, and this is one which David painted for the Hotel de Ville in Bruges. It's now in the Gruninger Museum there. Classical subjects are rarer in the north at this time than in Italy, but this story comes from Herodotus. Sassamnes at the right in red was an untrustworthy official of the Persian king Cambyses, and he was caught taking bribes. A sort of instant replay showing him accepting a bribe is to be seen at the upper left. Cambyses in the white robe at the left has himself now come to supervise the arrest and is numbering the crimes of Sassamnes on his fingers. Here you can see Sassamnes up closer, looking very guilty and worried indeed. His expression is much more convincing than those we saw earlier in Dirk Bout's similar work. This fellow seems to know the punishment for his crimes, and in the other picture David painted to go with this one, also in the Gruninger Museum, he's being skinned alive so that his hide can be made into a cushion for the king's throne. That's the bad news. The good news, I suppose, is that he did not commit any more crimes. I'll spare you the picture of his punishment on the assumption that you're already a generally law-abiding audience and don't need to be taught its lesson. This altarpiece by David was commissioned by Richard Vish at the left here. St. Catherine appears next to him. I'm not going to run through all the iconography here, but uh, another of her attributes besides the wheel is the wedding ring in reference to her refusal to marry the emperor, saying she was already the bride of Christ. David is certainly one of the most amazing technicians in the history of art but he's not even mentioned in Marilyn Stockstad's 1,200-page art history. You can see that the Flemish interest in, de in detail lasted right to the end of the Renaissance in Bruges. Every leaf on these trees was painted individually. And by the time David died in 1515, the heyday of Bruges was ending, and for 400 years or so, Bruges would become a second-class city, to be known finally in the 18th century, in fact, as bruges la Morte. Bruges the dead. Ghent, Antwerp, and Brussels became much more prosperous, but with that prosperity came the capacity and desire to rebuild, to modernize in a way that wasn't open to Bruges la Mort. And as a result, Bruges now has much more of its Renaissance atmosphere left, and ironically, it's that atmosphere that's made it prosperous once again. The last of the Valois Dukes, the great-grandson of Philip the Bold, was Charles the Bold, about whom we've heard a bit already in connection with what I was saying about his father, Philip the Good. This is a portrait of him in Berlin by Roger van der Weyden, and if you can think back to the St. Columba altarpiece and the fellow playing the role of the youngest Magus, I think there is a strong resemblance to be seen. At one time, Charles and the future Louis XI of France had been friends when Louis was forced out of France because of his support of the nobles who were the enemies of his own father Charles VII, he took refuge with Philip the Good and stayed from about 1455 until Charles' death in 1461 when he returned to be king of France himself. But after that, Charles the Bold and Louis couldn't be friends anymore. By that time, Charles was acting Duke of Burgundy, even though Philip the Good lived till 1467. The political ambitions of 
the two rules, Charles and Louis, were to put them directly at odds with one another. Remember that by the Treaty of Arras, which Chancellor Roland worked out with the French in 1435, Burgundy gave up its alliance with England and came back over to the French side. But Charles VII had given up some territory to Burgundy to help bring this about, and Louis now wanted it back. Louis, like his father Charles, had also angered the nobility by giving important positions to commoners, and Charles the Bold now threw his support behind the rebellious nobles to try to prevent Louis from having the time or capacity to seize the disputed territory. <laughs> The result was what is called the Guerre du Bien Public, the War for the Public Good, one of the more strangely named wars, certainly. It was essentially a one-battle war, and that one battle was at Montlhery, south of Paris, in 1465. This is an anonymous manuscript illustration depicting it. Philippe de Comines, the historian, fought the battle on the side of Charles the Bold and gives a very interesting eyewitness report of the affair. He says that Charles was cut in the throat with a sword, and his half-brother Anthony killed Louis XI's horse. The French did retreat, but the battle was essentially a draw, leaving Charles with the advantage. This is a sword that belonged to Charles. It's now in the Vienna Art History Museum. The scabbard looks exactly like it was made from the horn of a unicorn, and I'm sure that's what Charles thought it was made from. Unicorns were thought to have all sorts of magical properties, of course. The scabbard was, in fact, made from a narwhal tusk or horn, and the existence of these things, rare enough in their own right, must certainly have helped encourage the belief in unicorns. This one's on display in the Cluny Museum in Paris, which has the famous Lady with the Unicorn Tapestry series we'll eventually see. Anyway, Charles may have been wearing this sword at the Franco-Burgundian Summit Conference, which was held in 1468 at Peron, northeast of Paris. This produced a famous episode in which, more or less as Charles was just beginning negotiations with Louis, he was brought word that French spies had been captured in the act of fomenting a rebellion against Burgundy and Liège. Philippe de Comines says that Charles threatened to kill Louis on the spot, maybe with his very sword, and was only prevented from doing so by the intercession of Camine himself. Louis was in any case made a virtual prisoner and forced to make all sorts of concessions, at least on paper, before he was let go. Charles was, however, too bold or reckless for his own good, as Camine is the first to admit, he was, as Lady Carolyn Lamb said of Byron, mad, bad, and dangerous to know. Camine became disgusted with him, in fact, and defected to France, profiting greatly from the king's feeling that he had saved his life at Perun. By 1477, Charles had made enemies of just about all his neighbors, Louis, the emperor, the Swiss, René of Anjou, to name a few, and he was defeated by a coalition of them and killed at the Battle of Nancy. This is his tomb now in Notre Dame de Bruges. Jack London said he wanted to wind up as ashes, not dust, and I think Charles would probably have said the same. Here's the Gisan on the tomb. Camine, writing his history in France after his defection, says that all Charles really wanted was glory, but that only those who win get the glory, and that once dead there's little difference between the great and the small. Camine, in fact, is usually considered to be one of the first objective historians in the modern sense because of his realistic attitude to the motives of his subjects and his analysis of the causes and effects of events. Charles died with no male heir, which further exacerbated the problems of Burgundy. Six months after his death, his daughter Mary married Maximilian of Habsburg, the son of Frederick III and heir to the throne of the Holy Roman Empire. Maximilian gave his fiancée a diamond ring, which is supposed to have set a precedent for that expensive tradition. This is Charles's daughter Mary of Burgundy now by an anonymous painter. Mm -hmm. 
She was regarded as one of the great beauties of the day. Her marriage to Maximilian allowed the Habsburgs to make a claim on Burgundy, though Louis XI, of course, claimed it also since it was nominally a fief of the King of France. In the end, Louis kept the French portion of Burgundy, the area around Dijon, and Maximilian got to bring Flemish Burgundy, including Holland, into the empire. This is Roger van der Weyden's portrait of Anthony Le Grand Batard, the great bastard of Burgundy, the illegitimate son of Philip the Good and Charles the Bold's half-brother. It is in the Brussels Musée de Beaux-Arts now. If you can think back to the woman I called Miss Renaissance earlier, I think you'll agree that there's a close enough resemblance between them to suggest at least that they might have been brother and sister. In any case, Anthony was captured at Nancy by the French and held for ransom by Louis. But when Anthony's son refused to pay the ransom, Louis released him anyway, and he became a loyal French subject and trusted advisor to the king. Once at court, when he was 80 years old, he sat down in a chair reserved for someone else, and no one had the nerve to ask him to move. That might have been in part because his motto was, No one bothers me. Well, here now is a modern statue of Louis XI in Bourges, where he was born back when his father, Charles VII, was hiding out from the English who'd occupied Paris. Jean Molinet, who succeeded George Chastelain as something like official Burgundian court historian and, like Camille, was an official at the court of Charles the Bold, but did not defect, first called Louis the Spider, both because of his sort of humpback, gangly, limbed appearance and because of his devious, web-weaving political maneuvering, Louis is often said to have been tricky, deceitful, untrustworthy, treacherous. Someone has said, in fact, that he had all the qualities necessary to run for modern political office. He rarely saw his father, Charles VII, in his youth, and never seems to have felt any affection for him. Louis got involved, as we heard earlier, with the Duc d'Alençon and other rebels and was banished by his father to Vizil in the Dauphiné, his part of France as the Dauphin, the heir presumptive to the throne. This chateau was largely rebuilt about 1600, but two of the old towers survive in the center and on the left. As we also heard a bit ago, he was finally forced to leave France altogether because of his unfilial attitude and took refuge at the court of Philip the Good, where he became for a time the friend of his future enemy, Charles the Bold. This chateau is now used as a sort of retreat for the President of France and various politicians in need of a rest from the stress of Paris. Louis essentially grew up in the Loire Valley per force, and despite legends concerning his incognito tavern hopping in Paris with Francois Villon and other lowlifes, he spent little time there and wanted to make tour of the capital of France. This is a copy of a portrait of Louis, the original of which is attributed to Jean Fouquet. It's in the Brooklyn Fine Arts Museum now. Louis did not go in for the trappings of royalty and cared little for the ideals of chivalry in general. By reputation, rather than fight a duel with an enemy, he would bribe someone to stick a dagger in the fellow's back or poison his wine. Camille's history is remarkably candid in its treatment of Louis, but by no means everything he says about him is unflattering. His goal in life was not so much personal glory, but the unity of France at any cost, and he certainly has some sympathetic modern biographers. This is an anonymous pencil portrait of the historian Camille now, whom saint beuve in the 19th century called the first truly modern writer. As I've mentioned, he more or less saved Louis's life at Peron in 1468, and then defected to France in 1472 to become, for a time, one of the king's most trusted advisors. 
After Louis' death, he went with Charles VIII on his expedition to Italy, about which we heard last quarter. And he also accompanied Louis XII on his invasion of Italy in 1499. And all this experience makes him one of our most important sources for the whole history of the period. This is the Orant, the praying tomb figure from Camin's tomb, now in the Louvre. I'll read you just one passage here to give you a little bit of the flavor of his history. Speaking of Louis, he says, I never saw him free from cares and worries. Of all pleasures, he loved hunting and hawking, but nothing pleased him more than dogs. As for ladies, he never got involved with them while I was with him. And he swore an oath to God in my presence to touch no other woman but the queen his wife. And although this is no more than he ought to have done according to the laws of marriage, it was a considerable achievement seeing he had so many at his command to persevere in this resolution since the queen, though a good woman, was not one of those in whom most men take great pleasure. Again, in hunting, there was almost as much tedium as pleasure for he took infinite trouble. He hunted the stag eagerly and used to get up very early, often riding long distances, and not giving up whatever the weather. He frequently returned tired out, and nearly always angry with someone, for hunting is a sport which does not always go according to the plans of those in charge. The shells on Camin's tunic here indicate that he was a member of the Ordre de Saint-Michel, the Order of St. Michael, which Louis founded in hopes of creating a French equivalent to the garter or the golden fleece. Here you can see Louis himself presiding at a meeting of the order in a manuscript illustration by Fouquet. The scallop shell was the attribute of St. Michael because of his famous shrine on the sea coast at Mont Saint-Michel. The order did not last, however. For one thing, members were forbidden to ever remove their heavy gold collars, which was an unpopular burden. Despite his political realism, Louis was, in fact, one of the most superstitious men of his age. He made the Virgin Mary a French countess in hopes of getting her support at the court of heaven and was always praying to the saints of his enemies in hopes of enticing them into some betrayal. Will Durant says he went to Mass every day with the devotion of a dying nun. When Louis took the throne on the death of Charles VII, he fired some of the latter's advisors he felt had sided with his father against him. Etienne Chevalier, for example, was briefly imprisoned, but Louis did come to recognize that many of these men were in fact valuable, and as I mentioned earlier, he was, like his father, to have trouble with the nobility who resented the fact that the king preferred ability to nobility. This is the Chateau of Lelude in the Loire Valley, northwest of Tours, on the Loire, L-O-I-R river, though not on the Loire proper, L-O-I-R-E. The Loire is a tributary of the Loire. It was largely built by a boyhood friend of Louis named Jean Dion, who bought the old feudal fortress here, the big towers of which, though modified, still survive at the left. Like a lot of such buildings, it is uh, now a place which displays the styles of several centuries worth of restorations, rebuildings, modifications. It is still privately owned. This is one of the rooms in the 16th century wing open to the public. Despite their boyhood friendship, Dion deserted Louis for Charles VII, and when Louis became the king, he wrote a letter to him in which he said that he had need of his head, not his body, just his head. Dion did not wait for any more such correspondence and hid out in the caves of the valley until Louis finally pardoned him. These are the ruins of the Chateau of Lavardin in the Loire Valley, but like Lelude on the Loire L-O-I-R river to the north of the Loire itself. In Louis' day, this was the home of Jean de Bourbon, the brother of Jacques de Bourbon, who was the ancestor of Henry IV and the Bourbon kings of France. We'll hear about all them next quarter. He's supposed to have died while reading a poisoned letter from Louis. The 
this is the Chateau Vénet la Vieille. It was mostly built by Louis Chamberlain Charles de Chevenon de Bigny, whose descendants still live in it to this day. It's south of Bourges on the Cher, so it's not a Loire Valley Chateau, even though the Cher is a tributary uh, of the Loire. This is the Chateau Fort of Bonneguil, way down in the southwest near the Low River. In Louis' day, a renegade robber baron named Béranger de Roquefoy turned what was already a substantial medieval castle here into a virtually impregnable fortress from which he could lord it over the surrounding territory like a king in his own right. As I said, Louis' goal was to unify France, but the fact that a fellow like Béranger could come close to ignoring him shows that there was a lot of work to be done. The giant Gros Tour is 115 feet high and is considered the most impressive such thing still standing in France. Despite all of his troublemaking and his violent lifestyle, Béranger lived to 82 here and is buried in a church in the local town. Bonneguil is a real throwback to the Middle Ages in a time when much more elegant places were being built in the Loire Valley. Compare Bonneguil, for example, with Montresor near Chenonceau in the Loire Valley. It's more or less contemporary with Bonneguil, but certainly represents a different approach to country living even if it may still look like a fortress compared to your house. In the 15th century, it was owned by Imbert de Bastarnay, the grandfather of Diane de Poitiers, about whom we'll also hear next quarter. He was present at the conference at Pigigny, where Louis successfully detached Edward IV of England from an alliance with his brother-in-law, Charles the Bold, the Duke of Burgundy. This was a success in part because Louis told Edward he would have him escorted to all the best singles bars in Paris and send his personal confessor along so that if he committed any sin, it could be dealt with on the spot. Imbert was also involved in one of the more memorable medical events of Louis's reign. He was suffering from what was called the stone, although of what variety, gall, bladder, kidney, whatever, isn't specified. In any case, there was a prisoner in the Châtelet in Paris who was suffering the same symptoms and had been condemned to death for robbing a church. When this was brought to the attention of the king, he ordered the physicians to experiment on the prisoner to see if they could find a cure that would benefit his friend. The operation on the prisoner was performed here in the cloister of saint Severin, Paris, and was reported on by the notary of the Châtelet prison, who wrote that the body of the prisoner was opened, the situation of the malady observed, the body then sewn up and the entrails replaced. Not necessarily in that order, I guess. No mention is made of any anesthesiologist being present. The notary says that the man was well nursed on the king's orders and was completely well in a fortnight. The king even remitted his sentence and gave him some money. Imbert, however, was understandably reluctant to undergo the same operation, but the good news is that the stone or whatever it was seems to have cured itself, and he lived to 82. This is what's left now the Chateau of plessis les tours in Tours in the Loire Valley. As I mentioned earlier, Louis did not like Paris much and wanted to make Tours his capital. To that end, he built a large sort of ranch-style chateau there, only one small wing of which, however, survived the revolution. It was really in Louis' day that the Loire Valley became the favorite place for the French nobility to live, as I suggested, uh, and the area remained popular with this class pretty much until Versailles was built. Louis is not remembered as a patron of any of the arts, but the story goes that when someone was telling him about Josquin de Pré and about how skilled he was at writing for the human voice, Louis remarked, well, I'd like to see him write something for my voice. And when Josquin heard about this, he answered the challenge with the so-called 
Carmen Gallicum, or French song, and since I, like Louis, am among the singing impaired, I'll perform it quickly so you can recognize the king's part in a short performance we'll hear. This is the interior of Place Les Tours now. There's a fireplace and the translation of the lyrics to the song, which is close to being a nonsense uh, song. The translation goes, Guillaume is warming himself by the fire. And this is Louis's part. Guillaume va se chauffer auprès de la cheminée. Well, now uh, that you've heard it as Louis would sing it, we'll hear a more elegant, professional performance. And you should be able to pick out the sort of drone part intended for the king's raspy voice. Chateau of Saumur in the Loire Valley. Another of Charles VII's supporters who angered Louis was his uncle René, the Duke of Anjou and Bar, and Soi-disant King of Naples. René was the grandson of Louis d'Anjou, whom you should remember as the brother of Charles V, who commissioned the famous Apocalypse Tapestry. This chateau was mostly built by that Louis d'Anjou, but much remodeled in René's day, and it was Saumur, his favorite residence. René led quite an interesting life. He is supposed to have carried Joan of Arc to safety after she was wounded trying to take Paris from the English in 1429. He would have been 20 then himself. And he was imprisoned for a time in the Ducal Palace in Dijon in the days of Philip the Good when he came out on the short end of a squabble with one of Philip's allies. As I think I mentioned when we visited the place, the Tour de Bar, the oldest part of the palace in Dijon, was named after René, one of whose titles was Duke de Bar. He fought at Formigny in the victory over the English there, and as a member of the House of Anjou, got involved in the fight over Naples with Alfonso of Aragon, who was the eventual winner, as we heard last quarter. You may remember seeing Saumur in the Trevisures of Jean-Duc de Berry, who was René's grandfather's brother. In 1471, he moved out of the Loire Valley to the Chateau of Tarascon in Provence, which he owned and which you see now. This was primarily because of the enmity of Louis XI, who never forgave René's support for his father. By this time, he had, René, acquired a considerable reputation as a connoisseur of books and objets d'art, and as an author, an artist of some talent in his own right. There is, in fact, a tradition to the effect that he was at one time even a student of Jan van Eyck's. Here's the courtyard of Tarascon now. He brought his whole library and art collection down here with him. In the 1450s, he wrote a book on how to conduct a proper tournament but most of his effort as an author went into allegorical romances of the sort to which his most important literary work, Le Livre du Cour d'Amour et Prix, belongs. Here's the restored Grand Sal. It is, however, much more important for its illustrations than for the text itself, which is hard for a modern reader to really know how to take. Here you can see René in the so-called Burning Bush altarpiece, by Nicolas Fromont, it says something about René's reputation as an artist that this altarpiece was for a long time thought to have actually been painted by him, and that would have made this a self-portrait. Le Livre du Cour d'Amour et Prix, the book of the heart possessed by love, survives in several 15th century manuscripts, but by far the most splendid is the one now in the Austrian National Library, in the Hofburg there in Vienna. The illustrations in it have also, in the past, occasionally been attributed to René himself, 
but he had several illuminators and artists of various kinds on his payroll, and it is now thought that both the paintings and the calligraphy were done by a professional artist, probably Bartholomew de Clare. Here you can see one of the pages now. The text recounts a dream. Uh, Rene, seen here asleep in bed, had, in which his heart was taken by Cupid, or love, the fellow in blue, and given to desire the other guy with flames on his white tunic. This is usually considered the last real man masterpiece among handmade books. The printing press had been invented by this time, and pretty much all thought of painting the pages of its products was soon given up. Although its invention did give lots of employment, of course, to engravers, printmakers of all kinds. We'll see a few more pages from the Book of the Heart Possessed by Love now. And here a song by Antoine Bounois called Terrible Dame, the Terrible Lady. Bounois spent most of his career in Bruges and was in charge of the music for the service at saint Sauveur, which we saw there. He was also paid a retainer by Charles the Bold. Here René and Desire meet up with Lady Hope, who encourages him. And with the help of Lady Hope, he is now being rescued after being knocked into the River of Tears by Sir Trouble. In this picture, René encounters the Fountain of Luck, and the inscription implies danger is ahead for any lover. René's heart was then imprisoned by sloth, and desire is now looking for help. He runs into the page of the God of Love who promises his master will come to the rescue. Finally, René finds a boat to take him to the Island of Love, accompanied by two young ladies named Confidence and Acquiescence. And if he doesn't sink the boat in his armor, all should then end well. Well, that's where the book ends, it's where the song ends, and that's where the class will end today. Next time we'll hear about France in the days of Louis XI's son, Charles VIII, and in the days also of his successor, Louis XII, and then we'll see the work of one of the strangest artists in European history, Hieronymus Bosch. <laughs>